Recording in progress. Good evening and welcome to our weekly transformation class. As you remain muted, I'm going to ask you to join me as we read our sanctification confession. Let's begin. I am a sinner saved by grace. I was guilty of sin and I cherished it. My life was a willful offense to God. I didn't want him and didn't care if he wanted me. But despite my depraved existence and my evil and selfish ways, because of his grace and mercy alone, he chose me. My salvation is only because he drew me to himself. I was spiritually dead, and he awakened my spirit to be attracted to him. Now he wants me to know him and to have eternal life through him. He wants me to change through the process of sanctification and be more like him. But I have tried and know I am incapable of sanctifying myself. I want to sin because my sin nature is still alive. In my flesh is no good thing. My flesh is hostile towards God. It is an act of enemy of God. Nothing I do will sanctify me. Performance, good works, talents, and gifts do not qualify me. I can only be sanctified through his word and truth. I must commit to this process, dying daily to my fleshly ways and ideas. When I embrace the sanctification process daily, it will gospelize my life. I will be a new creature. His death, burial, and resurrection guarantee I really can have a different kind of life. Therefore, I pray for the word to seize my heart, to conquer the filth of my mind, and to capture the longing of my soul. I want to be sanctified. I need to be sanctified. I am determined to be sanctified. Well, again, tonight we greet you in Jesus' name, and certainly we give honor to our bishop, and we're always delighted to have her here with us. We give honor to our overseer and we thank God for you and to all the ordained personnel and to all of you who have joined us tonight on social media, we welcome you. And without further ado, I'm just going to turn it over into the hands of Pastor Angel Hush. Thank you. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Pastor Diane. Uh, praise the Lord, saints. I love the Lord and I love you with the love of the Lord. I honor the Lord on tonight and I honor our Bishop. Come on, put your hands together and throw up some heart reactions for our Bishop. Amen, God bless you, Bishop. And um, uh, I bring greetings to um, Overseer and uh, to our pastors and our pastors in training and all ordained um, <clears throat> personnel and to you, the people of God, in the Zoom room and on all streaming platforms, the Lord bless you richly and add no sorrow. Well, it is June 1st. Can you believe it? <laughs> my, my. And we are in the final month of the second quarter, which consists of April, May, and now June. And tonight, we continue our journey and it has been a rich journey. And first, I would like to introduce you to your transformation team for the month of June. Please throw up some hearts for Lady Aijanaya. Hi, darling. Sister Jane Kane 
and Deaconess Sarah McKenzie, fondly known as Mother Sarah. Come on and give it up for them, for you are in for a real treat on this month. All right, so um, during the entire second quarter and the entire year, we've been engaged in the theme, A Restored Generation. And our discussion for the second quarter has centered around the God of restoration. And the foundational book to support our theme has been the book of Joel. And as a recap, in the month of April, we dealt with three subtopics, the God of restoration, the Lord will have pity on the land, and the Lord will have pity on his people. We had some phenomenal teachers in the persons of missionary Patrice Bridgewater, Sister Awanda Booth, and our youth reader was none other than Lady Layla Thomas. Come on and give it up for them. Amen. Amen. Last month in May, the subtopics were God's choice tools of calamity and what do they signify? And God will remove the plagues he uses to punish his people. And Reverend Anthony headed up this month with absolutely awesome teaching coming from himself and Reverend Marshall. So come on and throw some hearts up for these thorough men. Amen, amen. And now, as we move forward and wrap this second quarter up, here in the month of June, my team and I will cover the following topics. It was the Lord's doing and how should God's people respond to calamity? So you're, you're gonna wanna come back. We're here for five whole Wednesdays this month. You wanna, you're gonna wanna come back each Wednesday night for these teachings. Tonight, we begin with the subtopic it was the Lord's doing. It was the Lord's doing. What was the Lord's doing? The calamity that was brought on his people in the land, the plague, the devastation, the desolation, that great army of locusts, remember them, was all the Lord's doing. It was a horrendous and tragic time, but not only was the plague and the devastation and the desolation and the disasters that we learned about in Joel the Lord's doing, but so was, here it is, the restoration. Somebody clap your hands right there. <laughs> Lady Aizaniah, would you please read Joel chapter two, verses 23 through 25? I'll be reading in your hearing, Joel chapter two, verses 23 to 25. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Be glad then, ye children of Zion, and rejoice in the Lord your God, for he hath given you the former rain moderately, and he will cause to, to come down for you the rain, the former rain, and the latter rain in the first month. And the floor shall be full of wheat, and the fat shall overflow with wine and oil. And I will restore to you the years that the locust hath eaten, the canker worm, the caterpillar, and the palmer worm, my great army, which I sent among you. So far the scripture. Amen. Thank you so much. So you see, the same God who sent the swarming army of locusts to ravage the land is also 
the same God who restores. It was the Lord's doing. This is what makes the message of Joel so significant to us and timeless. The book of Joel is timeless. Even though Joel is a minor or, or a minor prophet, there is nothing minor or insignificant about his ministry or his message. His message is timeless and forms a doctrine which can be repeated and, and applied to any age. What is, what, what is, what is that doctrine? And doc doctrine uh, defined is simply a set of beliefs held and taught by a church or religion. It's a teaching. So what is a doctrine? It's a teaching. So the doctrine we find here is that no matter how bad a crisis or a calamity may be, it is nothing in comparison to what could come from God if the people do not repent and turn back to him. Ladies and gentlemen, we didn't leave God back in BC or AD. Mm -mm, no, no. <laughs> we didn't leave him back in, 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 the, in the ancient days. We didn't leave him in antiquity. He is very much here today. He is ruling today. And I hate to tell you this, but we haven't seen nothing yet. But don't turn that down. <laughs> don't you dare stop streaming. This is why Joel admonished the elders of Judah to take the locust plague seriously. Somebody needs to take this pandemic, this COVID-19, whatever your disastrous situation is, seriously. Joel told them to call for the fast, rend your hearts and not your garments, weep and cry, howl between the porch and the altar. Because if this is happening, then God allowed it. It is the Lord's doing. Lady Aijanaya, please read Psalm 118, verse 23. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. This is the Lord's doing. It is marvelous in our eyes, so far the scripture. Amen. You see that? And the Hebrew expressed in this verse, for all of you Hebrew students, would read, this is from the Lord. This is from the Lord. So if this is from the Lord, what is God after? What in the world is God after? He wants his people to repent and turn back to him. That's what he wants. Now, I'm not getting into repentance tonight. Um, you can just, you know, pick up one of the earlier lessons because we dealt with repentance throughout this quarter. It was the thread of connection. You remember that? So, Disaster then is the prevailing theme prevalent and dominant throughout the book of Joel. But judgment can be averted if the people repent fast, return to the Lord and rend your hearts and not your garments. Lady Aijanaya, please read Joel chapter two, verse 13 and Joel chapter two, verse 17. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And rend your heart and not your garments and turn unto the Lord, your God, for he is gracious and merciful, slow to anger and of great kindness and repenteth him of the evil. Let the priests, the ministers of the Lord, weep between the porch of and the altar, and let them say, Spare thy people, O Lord, and give not thine heritage 
to reproach that the heathen should rule over them. Wherefore should they say among their people, where is their God? So far the scripture. Amen. Thank you so much. Okay. Anyone need some things averted in their life? This locust plague and drought had devastated Judah's land and weakened their economy. It was a time of depression and decline, and it became a time of national mourning. Lady Ajaniah, please read Joel chapter 1, verse 12. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. The vine is dried up, and the fig tree languages. The pomegranate tree, the palm tree also, and the apple tree, even all the trees on the field, are withered because joy is withered away from the sons of men. So far the scripture. Amen. Thank you, Lady Ajaniah. You hear that? Joy is withered away. Anyone need or want to get the joy back? Well, Joel uses the calamity. Hear me, somebody. He uses the calamity of the locust plague as a teaching moment. Ah, now see, here is where you get your joy back. He uses the plague to teach a prophetic lesson. And what is the lesson? If the destruction is from the Lord, then watch this, within the destruction, there is also a promise, you heard that? In the destruction, there is also a promise of hope, restoration, blessing and prosperity for the righteous and this is qualified, for those who call upon the name of the Lord. How do I know this? Lady Ajaniah, please read Joel chapter 2, verse 32. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And it shall come to pass that whoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. For in Mount Zion and in Jerusalem shall be deliverance, as the Lord hath said and in the remnant whom the, whom the Lord shall call. So far the scripture. Amen. Come on, somebody. You heard the scripture? Whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be delivered. <laughs> and those words, shall be delivered, is the Hebrew word malat. It's an interesting word because it denotes slipperiness <laughs> and it suggests escape. Like, you know, something slips out of your hand. You know, um, if you're into baseball and, and you watch uh, 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 baseball, and when, when those batters come out of the dugout because, you know, they're up for bat, you'll see them grab some uh, dirt or chalk or something and they wipe their hands because they don't want the bat to slip out of their hands. Uh -huh. So this word shall be delivered denotes slipperiness or escape. You know, it's like it is escaped my mind just that quick. You know how you, you try to think of someone's name and, 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 and just that quick it escapes out of your mind. Or like in Psalm 124 verse 7, where it reads, our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. And it also means to release or rescue. So whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be released from their tragedy and rescued from their crises. Can I get somebody to call on the name of the Lord? 
I, I don't know if it's a lost art these days, but, but somebody ought to call on the name of the Lord. You know, anybody need a way out or a way through? Deliverance is promised as well as restoration to whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord. Oh, oh I believe that. Come on, come on. I believe that. If you believe it, put it in the chat. I believe that. Ladies and gentlemen, this lesson teaches us that our help is in the name of the Lord. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and are safe. Glory to God. Now, now let, me, let, me, let me qualify this statement, the name of the Lord. Let, let me qualify the name of the Lord. This is the Lord who made heaven and earth. He's the creator and maker of the universe, the self-existing one. We, 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 we're, we, we, mm, we're not telling you just to call on anybody or any Lord, not, not just any Lord. I mean, after all, Baal, Baal is just a title that means Lord. So no, the Lord here I am referring to is the immutable and omniscient God. There's no God like him in heaven above or on earth beneath. Come on, somebody. If he made the heavens and the earth, that's no small feat. Surely he can make a way out of nowhere. After all, the Bible says darkness was upon the face of the deep. And God said, let there be light. <laughs> and there was light. So surely he can make a way out of a plague. <laughs> surely <laughs> he can make a way out of a calamity. I know he can make a way out of depression and oppression. In Mark chapter 5, he delivered and healed the gathering demoniac of legions of demons, for well, there were many. So I know he can make a way out of emotional, mental, and physical challenges. You, you, you don't have to be an integrationist. Just call on the name of the Lord. My God, he can make a way. He can make a way. He can make a way. Y'all know the song, You Made away. <laughs> so even though the plague, the calamity came from the Lord, it was the Lord's doing. Come on, I'm driving that home tonight. It was the Lord's doing. God always has his people's best interests at heart. He may have to turn you over to a test or a trial, or a plague, but he doesn't leave you there. Listen, we have evidence. When he sent Israel into Babylon, into the Babylonian captivity, he sent them in and brought them out. Lady Aijanaya, please uh, read Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 25, and then I want you to read Ezekiel chapter 39, verse 28. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Therefore, thus saith the Lord God, now will I bring again the captivity of Jacob and have mercy upon the whole house of Israel and will be jealous for my holy name. Then shall they know that I am the Lord their God which caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. But I have gathered them unto their own land and have left none of them any more. So far the scripture. Amen. And in verse 25, the words bring again means to deliver, reverse what has been done. Bring them home again, recover, refresh, restore. And this verse gives us the same sense 
that we heard in Joel chapter 218, where it reads, then will the Lord be jealous for his land and pity his people. And then verse 28 demonstrates how God led them into captivity, but restored them back to their own land. Come on, look at me, look, look at me. It was God who caused them to be led into captivity among the heathen. Come on, Beth Robert, put it in the chat. God did it. God did it. It was the doings of the Lord. Why? Why? Why does he do these things? Why is he going to take us up in there if he's going to bring us out? I'm glad you asked. He does it. He does it so the people would know their God. My Jesus. Lady Aishaniah, please read Joel chapter 2, 27. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. And ye shall know that I am in the midst of Israel, and that I am the Lord, your God, and none else, and my people shall never be ashamed. So far the scripture. Amen, and thank you. You heard? I am the Lord, your God, and none else. Isn't that what you heard? Come on, I need to know that's what you heard. Throw up some hearts or hands. Did you hear? I am the Lord your God and none else. Nobody else. No Buddha, no Allah, no Confucius, no Baal, none else. Listen, God's call is persistently for his people to return to him. Because sometimes, ladies and gentlemen, we get distracted. Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. <laughs> All it takes is a student loan bill to come in and you get distracted. All it takes is to go to the gas station and look at that $5 a gallon and you'll be distracted. <laughs> let, let me give you one more scripture to support this. Lady Aijaniah, please read Jeremiah chapter 29, verses 11 and 12. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. For I know that, for I know the thoughts that I think toward you, saith the Lord, thoughts of peace and not of evil, to give you an expected end. Then shall ye call upon me, and ye shall go and pray unto me, and I will hearken unto you. So far the scripture. Amen. And there it is again, calling on the name of the Lord. Calling on the name of the Lord. Did you call him today? Anybody call him up on today? My, my, my. Lady Ajaniah. Please read Isaiah chapter 40, verse 1. Here begins the reading of God's holy word. Comfort ye, comfort ye my people, saith your God. So far the scripture. Amen. Okay, okay. So, so, so we've been talking about various kinds of calamities. We've been saying that it is the Lord's doing. And, and we understand from the book of Joel that God doesn't leave his people in destitute situations. He does not leave his people in despair. He delivered Daniel out of the lion's den. He delivered the three Hebrew boys out of the fiery furnace. He delivered Joseph and Jeremiah out of a pit. And he delivered Jesus from the grave, from the dead. Hallelujah. <laughs> and we can go on and on and on. My Lord. But, but just remember this. God doesn't leave you there. 
Joel chapter 221 says, fear not, O land, be glad and rejoice, for the Lord will do great things. So far the scripture. So here we are over in Isaiah and we find a foretelling, a foretelling. It's a, fore, it's a foretelling. We have prophetic words of comfort. They are prophetic because the captivity did not occur yet. Oh my, 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 my. <laughs> you see, some of us would have never received this prophecy. But some of us don't like prophecy. What are you saying to me? I ain't never been to no Babylon and don't plan on going. Where in the world is Babylon? <laughs> but the prophet says, comfort ye. I see you in the future and you look much better than you look right now. Listen, be before I get into, into Isaiah to make my point, you, you know what is interesting about all of this is that God's people can't take telling. Your, your mother ever tell you that? Your parents ever tell you that you can't take telling? <laughs> Joel prophesies to the people while they are in a calamity and tells them rejoice. Okay, I want you to see this, the different scenarios here. Joel is there in a calamity and he prophesies to them <laughs> while they're in a destitute land and says rejoice. Go ahead and try and tell somebody to rejoice when they're not in a good way. He says rejoice, fear not. The Lord will restore. He will do great things. Okay, so Joel tells the people this, while there is no fruit on the vine. And like most people, I'm sure they probably said to themselves, oh, that's nice. But when? <laughs> when, when is it going to happen? He's going to do great things when? We need fruit on the vine now. Hmm. And then, then we come over here to Isaiah and the people are not, they're not in captivity yet. Not yet. They got a king, Hezekiah, whose house and dominion is full of treasures. And the prophet comes and says, comfort ye. <laughs> Jesus is Lord. <laughs> comfort ye. And I can only imagine that they looked at him and said, things are good. We good. We good. We good. What is this comfort you're talking about? We're good. <laughs> so the question we have to ask ourselves is, when are we going to believe? When are we going to believe? We must believe the whole counsel of God not just in good times or bad times, but all of the time. If it is the counsel of the Lord, if it is the Lord's doing, we must believe it. So chapter 40 is the beginning of Isaiah's prophetic message to those in the future who have to be taken into the Babylonian exile. And verse one expresses God's position with his people, knowing full well what he's about to do with them in the future. He's saying, he's, he's saying I have not thrown you away. I have not forgotten you. Neither have I forsaken you. I know what you're going through. I know what's going on with you. I'm all knowing and I'm all seeing. Comfort ye, comfort ye, my people, saith your God. Now, if he's your God, he's telling you, comfort ye. God is speaking to someone on tonight. Comfort ye, saith your God. 
In other words, be comforted. Have hope. Now, this comfort, let me just say right here, this ain't this kind of huggy, snuggle, comforting. This is have hope. Don't despair. Rejoice. Your redemption draw nigh. You see, Isaiah is talking to people who in their future state will be deeply discouraged. See, listen to me. Y'all don't like prophets. <laughs> but if they are ordained of God, I receive a prophet. <laughs> because the Bible says, he that receiveth a prophet in the name of a prophet shall receive a prophet's reward. Well, in any event, these are people who in the future will be deeply discouraged. These are people who have been carried away captive to Babylon and they are deeply distressed by their situation, by their cares and by their crises. And the word comfort as the Hebrew word has in mind is to strengthen and encourage. And so God is saying, encourage my people. See, don't just throw your arms around them and hug them, encourage them. In the midst of their discouragement, give them courage, give them my word, let them know I'm coming. <laughs> let them know I am going to rescue them. Speak tenderly to them, speak to their heart and let them know that I will show up. <laughs> Glory to God, I will show up. Come on somebody, he's coming y'all. He showed up for the Babylonian exiles by raising up a Cyrus who gave them permission to return, to leave and to return to their land. He showed up in Joel by having pity on his people, restoring the land and leaving a promise of the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. He showed up in Jesus who took on flesh, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost. Y'all know the story, born of the Virgin Mary. He showed up on Calvary when they hung him from a tree and he took on and died for the sins of you and me. He showed up on Easter morning when he rose triumphantly from the dead and he showed up on the day of Pentecost when he poured out his spirit on all flesh and fulfilled the promise given in the book of Joel. And I'm here to tell you tonight, comfort ye. Oh, my Jesus, glory to God. All of that which we spoke of on tonight, it was the Lord's doing, comfort ye. It was the Lord's doing, comfort ye. You may be going through a storm you may be in a crisis, but God is going to show up because he always does. Somebody, somebody put your hands together. He always, you know, I want to say he always do. <laughs> you know, <laughs> he always do. Come on, put that in the chat. He always do. He always do. God loves us, ladies and gentlemen. God wants to deliver us. God cares about our situation. He can deliver us and he will do it. Ladies and gentlemen, God is for you. And if God be for you, who or what can be against you? He is coming to strengthen you right where you are, right in that situation that looks so bleak. He is coming to strengthen you. He is going to deliver and equip you for whatever it is you are facing. He wants to deliver us. He can deliver us and he is going to deliver us. And we will say it is the Lord's doing and it is marvelous in our eyes. The Lord bless you.
Amen. Let's put our hands together for this marvelous presentation tonight. It just really summarized all that we've been talking about, about the book of Joel. If you miss any of the classes tonight, it just gave you a good overview of what was going on in Joel's time and why it was going on and what God intended it to do. And the main thing that I don't know about you, but the main thing that I got from all of this is God is not just sending them into captivity because he's cruel or he's capricious or he gets, he gets joy. You know how some people get joy out of hurting other people and they do things and then laugh. That's not the God that you serve. He's doing it specifically to have us. And she said, repent. That means to change our minds about holiness, about his, him being God, change our minds about idols so that we can turn to him and get close. So the intent, whatever calamity, whatever trouble that we go through, what is God doing? It's a training. It really means I am training you and training your mind so that you can repent. You can come back to me. You can be in agreement with me. You can see that this is what I want and not give me a hard time. You will be humble. You will acquiesce and you will submit. And as she said, you will rejoice. Now, this, this is why those things come and they don't lift right away. They don't lift right away because he has to work it out of us. We are humans. We like, we don't like trouble. We don't like difficulty. We don't like hardships. And when those things come, even in some of our theology, we are taught that it came because we didn't pray enough. We didn't fast enough. We didn't give enough, all of that. But then we have to take out 85% of the Bible because those, the, the, the characters in the Bible, they went through and they were chosen. They went through and they were called. Then get rid of Paul and Silas. What are they doing in prison? And they didn't get in there because they did anything offensive. They got in there because they preached the word of God. So that means that what God is working out in us comes through discipline. That's what he's doing. He's disciplining us so that we can be in agreement with him and don't give him a lot of lip, a lot of attitude, a lot of rebellion, a lot of shutdown, a lot of withdrawal, a lot of running, all of that. That's what he's working on so that we can lift our hands and say, thanks be to God that giveth us the glory. God, I don't understand, but I rejoice in your character. I rejoice in your goodness. I rejoice in your track record. You have never lied. You have never left me. You never abandoned me. And for a minute, I got confused, but I truly want to repent and ask you to help me. Just raise your hand tonight because trouble comes to confuse us. When these things come, it confuses us. And what God is saying, don't get confused. I'm working in your spirit, in your will, through the circumstances, through the situation, so you can raise your hand and be in agreement and love me anyhow. So just raise your hand and thank the Lord. We thank you for this lesson. We thank you, God, that sometimes these lessons come and they just come right and hit right at the core of the problem. This lesson came to the core of the problem and the core of the problem as it was in Joel's time. So it is in our personal lives individually. We have a problem with the way God works things out. We want it to be done so that we can be comfortable. But God, I thank you that you are not doing it to destroy us. You're doing it to make us to bring us. And somebody says, don't teach that theology. That's oppressive. That's not oppressive. Then don't expect grape juice unless you squeeze it. Don't expect tea unless you put it in hot water. Come on, ladies and gentlemen. Don't expect the train wheel to grow and move except there is friction. Everything in nature tells you something has to go through something to produce something. But it's the same thing with walking with the Lord. That's what she's saying tonight. Nobody sent it. 
devil didn't send it. All things work together for good. For we know, if you know, just begin to worship him. Come on, don't get confused. Maybe you forgot, but come back to what you know. Maybe the enemy tried to make you think something else, but come back to what you know. And where did you get the knowledge? Right out of the word of God. We see patterns. This is how he works. 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 He didn't take the children of Israel out of Egypt in one shot. No. Look how many times they had to uh, confront Pharaoh until finally he went in the Red Sea. So we know, we know, we know. What do you know tonight? Do you know him? Do you know that he's faithful? Do you know that he's just? Do you know that he's righteous? Do you know that he loves you? Do you know that he's able and he's willing and it is his pleasure? He delights in us. He delights in us, ladies and gentlemen. He delights to work it out so that we can come forth as gold. Come on and raise your hand and and don't look at it one-sidedly. Just look at the whole picture. Look at where the Lord has brought you. This is not the first time we've been in trouble. No. So what he did on yesterday, he can do it today and he will do it tomorrow. So Lord, we thank you for the lesson. We thank you for the teacher. We thank you for the book of Joel. We thank you for the lessons that came out of Joel into our living room, into our bedroom, into our relationship, into our thinking, into our attitude, into our reality. In the midst of all of this evil, you're still saying, these are my people, and I am bringing them to a place of intimacy and closeness and relationship. And we magnify you. Remember the speaker tonight. Remember the teacher tonight. Encourage her heart. Strengthen her, God. Provide for her and cover her. Because we know, God, when we speak the truth like this, the enemy is stirred. But we put him at bay tonight in the name of the Lord Jesus. For the name of the Lord is a strong tower. Hmm. And the righteous runneth in and is safe. Lord, have mercy. Come on and praise him. I said, the name of the Lord is a strong tower. And the righteous run it there in and is what? And is safe. Come on, we're safe tonight. I don't care what's happening around. The name of the Lord is our strong tower. And for those of you who are out there that joined us tonight, remember the lesson. I hope you took notes. I hope you, and if you miss it, you can always go back because it stays up for a while on our, on our Facebook or in our, um, uh, on the social platform. So you go and take notes because listen, you, things may be rough right now, but the Lord said, comfort, I am with you. I will bring you out. I will make a way. That's why I love the song. He made a way when our backs were against the wall and it looked as if it was over. He, God made a way. He, he caused mountains to fall. Yes. He makes a way. He knows how to do it. And we, you know, we don't know why, but we're so glad he did. So come on and thank the Lord and thank you so much. And we're going to receive an offering tonight because we want to give to the house of the Lord so we can continue to encourage people in the midst of their discouragement, in the midst of their hopelessness. And when you give, you make it possible for people to receive what they need to live in a world that's filled with evil and filled with discouragement in a world that's filled with murder and violence. We're here to encourage people that God is still with you and he will keep you and hold you. And we speak to the minds of the parents and to that community, God. And they had the funeral and you could see the sadness. And we ask that you send healing, healing through your word, healing. Send somebody there that we can minister life to those people who feel so distressed and hopeless. We send the word of the Lord. We send the word of the Lord that that community will be healed in Jesus name. Amen. Come on and go join us in giving right now. Jesus, I'll never forget what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget, no, never. Jesus, I'll never forget 
what you've done for me. Jesus, I'll never forget how you set me free. Jesus, I'll never forget how you brought me out. Jesus, I'll never forget, no, never. And the song says, how can I forget? Come on, raise your hand and say, how can I forget what he's done for me? Now, sometimes we get a little forgetful, but it takes a word like tonight to remind us that we have something to remember. Come on, raise your hand and say, I have something to remember. I have something to remember. I don't care if it happened 10 years ago, five years ago, five months ago, 10 minutes ago. I don't care. You have something to remember of what he has done for you personally and not only for you, but for your neighbor and your friend and your family member and for the church community. So we are not going to forget what he has done for us. Amen. We are going to remember. Thank you so much for joining us. And we would be back here by the help of the Lord on Friday night. And somebody says, you all are so routine. You have Wednesday and Friday night. Don't you ever get bored? Because every time we get together, we get strength. We hear, we receive, and we grow. Go with that in mind. In Jesus' name.